good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar series of the Reclaim Network Plus. Uh, this is webinar number 24, so the time has gone very quickly. Uh, um, this, if you don't, uh, you know, know the Reclaim Network Plus, this is a um, the project which was funded by the UKRI, so three councils, EPSRC, NERC, and AHRC, and uh, um, it's uh, led by the University of Surrey in collaboration with the University of Bangor, University of Warwick, UKCH, and University of Bath. Uh, so this seminar usually happens, uh, you know, the every first Wednesday um, of the month between 12:30 to 13:30, and this is our team, uh, which uh, you know brings a very multidisciplinary perspective to the network. And they're joined by our network manager, project officer, and a network fellow. So, um, so this network, uh, you know, has grown quite a lot uh, since uh, um, it started two years back. So, as you can see, we have around 587 members uh, to date, and these numbers are increasing uh, almost, uh, you know, the every every month. Um, and this, they come from a wide range of. Uh, you know, the backgrounds is starting from academics and research. As you can expect, there is a um, almost 60% uh, of, uh, you know, the, the members coming from there. But the more interesting thing is to see uh, the participation from NGO and charities, consultancy services, local government, businesses, and uh, the community groups. So this is uh, um, not just an academic kind of an activity. Uh, it has got an involvement from a wide range of uh, you know the stakeholders and they have got interest in the areas of public health and well-being uh to you know uh looking into the economic opportunities and uh, the green walls and so on so um so we um so we basically have usually two speakers in each webinar and they both have 20 minutes to speak all these webinars are recorded, so uh, we will post you the link in the chat box so you can go and have a look at the, the previous ones. Uh, the last one was delivered by um, uh, Tom Wild from the University of Sheffield and Dr. Louis Firth from the University College Cork on very interesting topics. Um, so, um, and this is gonna run, I know, until the network kind of ends of formally until February 2025. Um, so uh, uh, if you are interested in the topics and you wanted to present, so you can write to uh, this email, what's written on the screen uh, to become a speaker or just write to any of the team members of the network and we will be in touch and uh, you know, uh, slot you, uh, uh, provide you a slot actually for the, uh, for the presentation. Um, so today we got a very interesting lineup of speakers. So the first talk is gonna be with Dr. Alessio Russo, um, and the another talk is going to be uh, divided by two of the colleagues, Professor Lauren Jones, who is also the uh, the co-lead on this network uh, from the UKC side, and Stefano uh, Barisi, who is Ecosystem Service Officer at Wildlife International. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Um, Alessio uh, Russo. So he's a senior lecturer in landscape architecture and uh, uh, at the University of Queensland, uh, um, University of Technology in Brisbane. Um, and he has over 15 years of international experience researching, lecturing, and consulting on urban green infrastructure, urban forestry, and ecosystem services. Before joining QUT, so he served as a senior lecturer in landscape architecture and academic course leader for the masters in landscape architecture and the University of Gloucester. Uh, he's also the winner of one of the um, the the large projects, Reclaim Network Plus funded, and uh, uh, he's going to be talking about the project today. So, Alessio, over to you. Just to say in the meantime that uh, if you have any questions, uh, we will pick them up uh, in the end. So please write those questions using the Q&A chat box in there, and you can write your name and affiliation with it if you want it to be read. 
And I have my colleague, Pro Professor Seela Malam. So she will be uh, chairing that Q&A session after these two talks, which are going to go one after another. And you're on mute, Alessio. Oh, OK. K can you see my presentation? Yes, and we can hear you. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, greetings from Brisbane. Uh, so today, um, I want to talk about our project, Urban Rewilding Aesthetics and People Needs into Multifunctional Blue and Green Infrastructure Design, which was funded by the Reclaim Network Plus. So this project uh, investigates both the challenges and the multiple functional benefit of rewilding in urban context. So I see that it's not showing. Is sorry, it's, it's not showing all the affiliation. One second, I will try again. Sorry. Before was. How can I stop? Sorry. Stop sharing. Yeah, I don't know why. Can you see the image, the affiliation? No, we can only see the reclaim image and the project team, the names. Uh, before I could see everything, can you share the my presentation? You have my presentation. If yes, I don't know if it's my problem here, but before yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's yeah, no problem. So yeah, it's it's, it's not showing the images was. It's yep, in the PowerPoint. Right. Yep. Can you scroll the next to see? The next? Yes. Yeah, you can see a uh, strange. <laughs> Sorry, who is online? So, yeah, because it's important. Um, so, yeah, the project team, as you can see, uh, uh, we have a team that is uh, expert from different countries. So, from the UK, we have Alice. Adam, David, um, Kevin, and also we have uh, partners or so experts uh, from uh, Poland, from the States, uh, Japan, and also Malika that is from uh, uh, South Africa. Next, please. Uh, so rewilding. So the word rewilding was coined in the middle of the 90s by a group of US conservation biologists who were inspired by deep ecology theory and introduced rewilding as a scientific case of continental wildland strategy. So the concept, as you can see here, was to re reintroduce wolf. And I just Googled rewilding in the UK. And, and so this image in the middle is related to the UK. And also I Googled rewilding in Australia and uh, I saw images of koala. Um, next, please. Um, so also I was looking for publication about rewilding. And as you can see on this graph, the number of publication uh, so increased from 1987 to uh, uh, 2019. Uh, so publication on uh, rewilding, uh, also wilderness. And what we found out there is that somehow rewilding is a buzzword. And also this was publishing house and garden. So the green rewilding controversy, what does the buzzword of the moment really mean? Next, please. And what we noticed that uh, after the pandemic, so we saw publication in, in uh, 2019, but this is 2020. So you can see that the, uh, the pandemic offers an opportunity to rewild our communities. Next, please. And as you again, the pandemic 
focus on rewilding urban green spaces. Next, please. And this is United Nations, world must rewild are from on massive scale to heal nature and climate. Next, please. And rewilding our city, beauty, biodiversity, and the biophilic cities movement. Next, please. And even at the Chelsea Flower Show, so they present a, a rewilding Britain landscape. And also, I don't know if you heard about uh, Monty Don, the interview about the Rivaldi. And so what we found from the literature, next please, that Rivaldi is a controversial approach. So 30 years after it was first proposed as a biodiversity conservation strategy, the concept remained dispute with scholars arguing for and against its implementation. Uh, critics note the absence of uh, consistent definition of rewilding. And also the main concern is that rewilding remove people from landscapes. Next, please. So uh, what is the primary objective of this research? So was to create a set of resources can assist local authorities and other land managers in determining how, where, what types of urban rewilding might benefit local communities. Next, please. And so uh, the methodology, uh, we had focus groups, research through design during workshop, um, online surveys, interviews, um, and our target uh, were local uh, authorities and also local communities, so people. Next, please. So we had a focus group last February 2023 uh, with local authorities to understand their perspective. Uh, so the focus group was to explore the understanding and utilization of the term rewilding and to identify the objective concerning rewilding initiatives in their respective areas. Next, please. So what we found from the focus group was contrasting views from local authorities. So the emerging themes were urban exclusion, so some believe rewilding exclude human needs in urban contexts. Um, so we found also conceptual challenges, issues with interpretation application of the term rewilding. Um, another issue was scale requirement, perception of large scale setting for rewilding projects. And also another theme was about the rural origin. So rewilding models uh, that are emerging from rural landscapes. Uh, next, please. So after the uh, focus group, then we decided to see if that uh, the emerging themes that we found with uh, several local authorities was also at the UK wide scale. So we had uh, an online survey targeting professionals working in UK local government to gather information, their understanding, practice, and challenge, challenges related to urban rewilding. And as you can see, the, this is the poster. So also thanks to the network, the Brooklyn network that post the, uh, the online survey. And also we contact um, local authorities and the next slide, please. Uh, so the survey cover definition. So how will you define the term rewilding? Um, also rewilding opportunities and barriers. And also we had a separate section for those authorities not currently undertaking rewilding initiative titled rewilding opportunities and barriers not currently implemented. And also demographic to understand where uh, the responses were from. Next, please. 
Uh, these are the results from the uh, UK local authorities. Uh, so interpretation of urban rewilding. Uh, so many definition emphasizes bringing back element of wilderness and allowing natural processes to occur within city environments. Um, a common theme that we found was increasing biodiversity and creating more natural urban ecosystems. Uh, several responses highlight the importance of allowing natural regeneration and minimizing the need for intensive management practices. And some responses also seen rewilding as a broad set of nature-based solution for climate change adaptation. Next, please. But from local authorities, so from the comments that we analyzed, uh, rewilding was also simple as uh, a wildflower meadow reducing maintenance um, as current project in, in or past project in the UK, like the wildflower power in uh, Plymouth. Um, next, please. So uh, wildflower meadow was perceived as uh, a rewilding approach. And um, next, please. And as you can see here is uh, Plymouth, if you know, uh, so the difference in maintenance, uh, again, was perceived as rewilding. So it's not uh, related to the original concept of rewilding. Remember, I showed the wolf and <laughs> the koala. Uh, next, please. And what are the motivation? Uh, so the motivation were related to environmental concerns, so biodiversity loss, climate change, and habitat restoration. Next, please. And other motivation were cost saving. Uh, rewilding can sometimes lead to reduce maintenance costs for green spaces. Um, one aspect that was also highlighted in terms of motivation uh, rewilding can create opportunity for recreation, improve air and water quality. But this is from an interview. We need future research looking also at this aspect. Uh, because here in, the, in this chart, I can see we have the expert about the air. And, um, and also was also highlighted the benefit about mental and physical health. Next, please. Uh, location motivations. So the opinions uh, differ with their um, uh, motivation for rewilding were based on location, urban, mix, rural. And also there was a potential focus areas. Uh, so from the uh, survey uh, was perceived that urban areas might prioritize health and well-being while rural location might focus on broader ecological benefits. And also what we find, the adaptive methods, regardless of the location, the core principle rewilding can be adapted, adapted to local context. Next, please. And, and here are the challenges that were perceived by local authorities. So uh, the challenge was about public perception and education. So it was about overcoming negative perception. Uh, so the concern were, uh, was about the public, my view, while there is as messy or neglected. Uh, so the solution was, was about educating the public. So there is a need to educate the public about the benefits of rewilding and manage expectation, and also balancing aesthetics with ecology. Uh, so it was balancing the sometimes competing desire for a natural look and manicure. Uh, aesthetic can be difficult. Next, please. 
Other, other challenges uh, were funding and resourcing. Uh, so one challenge was securing long-term funding. Uh, another challenge was related to staff expertise, a lack of staff with the necessary skill and knowledge for implementing rewarded techniques. Another challenge that we found was communication and was again related to staff, the lack of staff to communicate the motivation and expect outcomes of rewarding efforts to the public can be a barrier. Next, please. Um, so is urban rewarding taking root in the UK? So this is a survey from the UK. So to the question, are you taking rewarding initiative within your local authority, even if the term reward is not used? We found that 87.2 responses are taking rewarding initiatives. Uh, next, please. And to the question, does your local authority have plans to include reward initiative in the future? We found that the 71.8 responses have plans to include reward initiative in the future. So yes, urban reward is taking root in the in the UK, even if they are using different term. Next, please. And this was the I try to summarize the challenges and opportunities from local authorities. Also, we have um, now has been accepted just yesterday one paper from one local authority. So I include the reference at the end of my public of my uh, presentation uh, has been accepting uh, landscape urban planning. So uh, at the end of my presentation, you can see the the reference. Uh, so, so then we want to understand the perception from local uh, authority uh, from local communities. So we ran a, a design workshop last March. Uh, it was a three-day design workshop. Um, we focused on one area in Cheltenham, that is the Hanimburg line, and during the the workshop. We have, uh, so the task was to create different scenarios. So the first one was do nothing. And what we, the second scenario was asking the participant to create a moderate rewarding. And the third one was intensive rewarding. And the last one was total signature landscape approach. So it was high maintenance. Uh, landscape. Um, next, please. And then we, using AI, we use this uh, draft from the three-day workshop to have an online survey with the community. And so we had the first that was the high maintenance landscape the one that you can see everywhere. And then we had the scenario of moderate rewarding. And the last one uh, was intensive rewarding. Next, please. And also we had a community workshop uh, last December with the uh, local community in Cheltenham. And we use the same uh, scenarios that we had for the uh, online survey with the community. Next, please. So these were the scenarios. Uh, so this is uh, the first image is existing situation in Cheltenham. And this we decided to label as uh, moderate rewarding, and uh, the last one here we label as intensive rewarding. Next, please. Um, and then we ask during the 
uh, workshop, the last workshop that we had in, uh, in December, we asked, for example, how do you think these changes might affect you? How happy you feel? How healthy you are? The cost of your rent house value will be influenced by which scenario? So all this we asked during the last workshop. Next, please. So this is a citizen perception. Uh, this was done by David. So he found that uh, the value of existing wild areas in, uh, in Cheltenham. So we found that uh, residents and visitors value existing wild areas in familiar green spaces. Um, what we found that was about the understanding of urban rewilding. So this uh, survey was done last July. Uh, so after rewilding was on the news. Uh, and so what we found was the most respondents have moderate to good knowledge of urban rewilding. So I think was because as I showed in the first uh, slides, um, yeah, there was uh, uh, Monty. Yes, that was the um, was on the news. So this can somehow uh, has influenced this uh, response that the majority of people they know about urban rewilding. Uh, other aspect that we found was uh, that uh, citizens view urban rewilding as a valuable future in Cheltenham's green spaces. Next, please. And then we use the WHO, uh, WHO's uh, five scale for well being. And what we found that moderate, moderate rewarding seen generate the highest well being responses. Uh, related to perception of safety, uh, we found that moderate wild spaces are perceived as the safest. And on the other hand, intensive rewilding are perceived as the least safe space. So this is uh, all information uh, important for local authorities when they want to implement uh, rewilding projects. So moderate are perceived as safe, but um, if local authority want to use an intensive rewilding approach, they need to consider the, this perception of uh, people that unfortunately is, is, is perceived as the least safe. Next, please. Um, the last aspect that we look at the uh, citizen, uh, citizen perception was about the temporal aspect, nighttime. So people that they use uh, green spaces or rewilding green spaces. And uh, what we found that from the responses, lack, uh, the lack of lighting, uh, so participants frequently express concern about the absence of lighting. So all these design aspects uh, are very important uh, for implementing rewilding. Next, please. And I want to summarize uh, from, from this project and what is our understanding about rewilding from local authorities and uh, uh, people perception is that rewilding is yeah, it's a buzzword as the first uh, slide and we need to define urban rewilding, but also is perceived as an approach that can deliver several ecosystem services uh, so these are like social inclusion in, and community engagement. Also can provide regulating and supporting services like carbon sequestration, 
Um, other aspect that was mentioned also during the first group can be food security. So rewilding can provide areas for, for food. And the other aspect that was highlighted in the survey, even in the uh, focus group, is the biodiversity. Uh, so biodiversity is also related to health and well-being. So with the Rewaldi, we can uh, increase biodiversity at, this, at the same time. We can improve uh, our health and well-being. And the last one that I forgot to mention is Rewaldi can be a, a refugee for insect pollinators. So we had an issue with pollinators and Rivaldi can be the right approach. I don't know how many minutes I have left. I... So just to wrap it up, actually, I think we, you got your time. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I was lost with the, 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 the slide. So yeah, so uh, Rivaldi has several potential. And the next slides. And I want to mention, as I said, we we just this this morning, no, just yesterday, well, with Kevin, uh, we published this paper that is exploring the implementation of Rewilding in a British local authority, overcoming challenges and maximizing opportunity for landscape management. And uh, that has been accepting landscape urban planning. And in this uh, paper, there is um, uh, a blueprint framework for local authorities that they can use uh, to implement uh, urban rewilding uh, also in other uh, authorities, local authorities. And also uh, there is another paper that you can, can read that is about community perception. Um, of brownfield regeneration through urban rewilding, so it's sustainability, so it's open access. And also the first one should be open access, I can see from the chat. Can you share the paper? Yes, we will share the paper. And I will share the paper with the, uh, with the networks, with the Reclaim Network. And also we are uh, publishing, we hope, because also publishing takes time, uh, we hope to publish the results from the focus group with local authorities and the national survey, uh, and also the, the survey and the community workshop uh, from people. So yeah, we are still working uh, on, the, on the paper, but yeah, when the papers they will, will be published, we will share with the network. And um, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alicia. It's a very important topic and very interesting presentation. And it's good to see the results being published. So that could be made widely available. So yeah, please feel free to share the link in the chat box. It could also be the case that you could share the information with the, uh, you know, our team there. So we could also highlight it through the, uh, the newsletters. So yeah, yeah that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So before, um, you know, without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce to the next speakers. So the next presentation is um, shared by two colleagues. So Professor Lauren Jones. So his research covers uh, three areas: the ecosystem service theory, and spatial modeling, effects of air pollution on semi-natural ecosystems and coastal ecology, so which is looking into the sand dune systems and surface hygiene. Uh, he's a group leader of 17 staff and is the thematic lead of urban research in UKCH with an increasing focus on modeling the benefits that people receive from urban green and blue spaces. So he works increasingly in interdisciplinary settings with partners all over the world, and he has uh, over 100 general papers with an H index of 40. And another colleague uh, who is joining today is Dr. Stefano Marchisi. Uh, he is the Ecosystem Service Officer at the World Life International, where he coordinates the science work on his focus area, including further development of the toolkit for ecosystem service site-based assessment. This is called TISA, 
and support uh, um, in its use in bird life partners. Stefano has a PhD from the University of Florida, for which he studied the trade-offs in ecosystem services of a large wetland site in Costa Rica. Prior to that, he worked for 10 years with IUCN Global Water Program on several multi-regional projects, demonstrating the value of nature-based solutions for sustainable water resource management. So today you will hear about TISA, so I'm going to pass it on to our colleagues. So over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Kumar, and hello everyone, and uh, greetings from Cambridge. So, let me see if I... Yeah, as we know, and we heard today as well, information about ecosystem services can guide decision making and support protection and management of natural ecosystems including in urban areas to ensure um, sustainable flow of benefits for current and future generations. So the idea for a toolkit like TESA uh, emerged precisely from this pressing need to understand the impacts of actual and potential changes in land use and land cover on biodiversity, but also on the resulting benefits to people. So this toolkit um, needed to be a practical guidance framework which details the steps to assess the ecosystem services of a site of interest. And so it was with this in mind that BirdLife started developing the toolkit for ecosystem service site-based assessment, now commonly known as TESA, in 2013-2014. So it's since been a collaboration with academics, conservation practitioners, and other experts from a core of six organizations that for the most part also form the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. The practical steps included in um, TESA are all intended to guide in identification of important ecosystem services at the site, of methodologies to use and data to collect to measure these services and to guide how to present the results of this assessment to different audience effectively. Along with the services provided by the site, TESA also helps identify the drivers of change and the beneficiaries and the services to other stakeholders, but also other key actors such as policy and decision makers on land use planning and management. To inform local decision, ecosystem service assessments need to be based on data that are locally appropriate, easy and relatively affordable to collect, and useful for communicating trade-offs to decision makers. So unlike TESA, most approaches to measuring ecosystem services do not normally provide for all these needs at the same time. And um, uh, TESA is also mostly relevant for sites that are typically between 100 and 10,000 hectares in size. So though it's primarily targeting conservation practitioners, the methods are applicable to a wide range of users, including natural resources managers, land use planners, development organizations, and increasingly the, the private sector. Now, because the ultimate goal when using TESA is to determine the changes in ecosystem services and beneficiaries related to management or land use planning, the assessment relies on a comparative valuation of the services between the current state of the site under study and an alternative state. The alternative state is a hypothetical scenario describing the most realistic future conditions of the site, for example, a change in the protection status or effective management of the site, if, say, conversion to agriculture is expected to take place um, inside this area. So this counterfactual approach for the assessment provides decision makers with the net consequences of their proposed changes to the ecosystem and the loss and gain of the benefits for human well-being. So outcomes of a test assessment are consequently well placed in management um, to influence policies uh, in management and land use planning. Um, in the first five years since it was first launched, the BirdLife Partnership supported TESA in around 100 sites worldwide, including through piloting of the methods and approaches presented in the toolkit. So nearly 70% of these sites uh, were important bird areas or key biodiversity areas. Meanwhile, the field has been changing and with the push for nature-based solutions in the sustainable development agenda, as we know, urban green areas are increasingly looked at in terms of both biodiversity and ecosystem services that they can provide. So it was also within this context uh, that through a Cambridge Conservation Initiative grant, we worked with the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to add a new module on air quality regulation by vegetation to the toolkit. 
The rationale for the project was that the air quality regulation provided by ecosystems in both rural and urban areas is an important service, service which had been just highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but practical tools for non-specialists to measure and communicate these benefits had been lacking. So the project ran from August 2022 to December 2023, and along with a new TESA chapter, a meta model was produced, which Professor Jones is going to talk more about in a second. So up to that point, the toolkit had featured modules for assessing eight different types of ecosystem services, namely global climate regulation, water-related services, nature-based recreation and tourism, harvested wild goods, cultivated goods, pollination services, coastal protection and cultural services. So the latter three modules were added in 2017 and version 3.0 of TESA was released in uh, November 2022 as a new interactive PDF format. And until a version 3.1 is produced, the standalone new chapter can be found at the download page that we will show again at the end of this presentation. And I'd like to um, Professor Jones to take over. Okay, um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit about the modeling work we did behind the scenes to develop this new module for TESA. So the basic principle is that trees or any vegetation removes uh, pollutants from the atmosphere through different mechanisms, through tri deposition onto leaf surfaces um, or uptake through stomata. And then this has a consequence that improves air quality, so it reduces pollution concentrations. And there are two different outcomes that we wanted to represent in this new module. So one was the change in concentration, which has a, an outcome of improved human health. And the second was something that hasn't actually been done before, which is at this kind of scale, which is to look at changes in nitrogen deposition. Um, because that has uh, other impacts on biodiversity. So next slide, please. OK, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the, the toolkit. So um, we use uh, a high power computing model called EMEP, uh, coupled with a, a, a weather forecasting module. So essentially, this is this uses high power computing. It can deal with 80 different chemical pollutants. It deals with all of the chemistry and meteorological interactions. Um, and it incorporates atmospheric transport. So to set up and run a scenario using this uh, EMIP coupled model can typically take two to three months. It takes time to set up the scenarios, run the model, do the quality assurance, post processing, etc. So what we need to do for for TASA was basically create a meta model approach, so we can derive results from these large model runs <coughs> to then derive the simpler equations that we can put into a spreadsheet. Um, let's slide. And it can be done at finer scale as well, so you can bring in you know, fine scale vegetation to feed into the model run. So this shows an example where essentially we run this as the kind of high power model, but just showing how, how it produces output. So this is looking at woodland planting at national scale in Wales and the UK. Policies to change agricultural use, increase woodland planting. And we can see that there's a, a decrease in PM 2.5 concentrations. Next slide. And then these are examples of the meta models that we produced from these kind of model runs. So on the left is a as an equation to predict pollution removal. On the right is an equation to predict the change in PM concentration. And both of these are a function of woodland cover, but also background PM concentrations. Next slide. So that's just an illustration of how we've done this approach in the UK, but for TESA, this obviously needed to be globally applicable. So we can run EMAP at global scale, but it's a coarser resolution, so one degree grid, so that's around 100 by 100 kilometers at the equator. So we did some initial runs to see what the key drivers were in terms of changing PM concentrations. So we 
what other factors affect this? You know, is it affected by vegetation type? Is it affected by climate variables, for example, other pollutants? So we did some uh, sort of simple scenario setup where we just manipulated land cover. And the top panel shows the change in PM 2.5 concentration as a result of changing woodland. And then the bottom panel shows the wooden cover that's contributed to that. So you can see that the pattern sort of reflects patterns of woodland, but there's obviously other things going on. So what else is affecting these response functions, these relationships? Next one, please, Stefan. So we did some statistical testing, sort of model testing, and somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, uh, climatic factors like rainfall and temperature weren't key drivers of the outputs. If you look at the bottom panel, PM 2.5 is a key driver. So the background concentration affects the efficiency of removal of additional PM. And then sulfur dioxide showed a weak relationship, but it wasn't really strong enough to incorporate that factor into the model. So, so that was a, a sort of initial run at 100 kilometer grid. So we then moved on to the more detailed runs to try and actually develop proper equations. So we picked, uh, we picked a region of the world, so East Asia, where we have uh, a lot of the data set up already. And the advantage of this is it spans all of the biomes from tundra in the north right down to tropical in the south. And we set up different scenarios essentially to test the effect of different land cover types, so crops, different types of woodlands, uh, grassland, etc., shrubs, and to derive a separate equation for each of those different types. And this just shows a, a, a sort of scenario where you compare the, the baseline and the, the, the kind of scenario you've created to see a change in pollution concentrations. Slide. So again, a further sort of round of model development and testing. So testing which habitats showed a significantly different relationship from others. So the groupings are different for these different habitats. But essentially, we produce a biome specific equation that's relevant for that particular function. So the top graph shows the change in concentration. And the, the steepest concentration comes from looking at uh, trees, which is combined broadleaf and evergreen. Um, and then the, the sort of much lower concentrations come from yeah. concentration change comes from vegetation like um, crops and grassland, for example. There are different response functions for different uh, biome types. So some of these take into account uh, kind of you know, biomes of the world. So there's a separate function for boreal trees. Sometimes these are grouped. So it depends on whether they're significantly different or not. And the bottom graph shows the same, going through the same process, but to calculate quantity of pollution removed, quantity PM 2.5 removed. And there was sort of less differentiation between vegetation types for that. So we only have two or three main response functions for that, that particular equation. Next slide. And again, went through the same process for nitrogen deposition, <clears throat> tested lots of different predictors. And interestingly, the uh, the kind of background nitrogen concentrations for ammonia or nitrogen dioxide or interactions with other pollutants, they weren't significant actually. And the strongest relationship also came from background PM concentrations. So we well, we don't quite understand why that was, but it produced the strongest relationship, and this was this held right across this East Asia domain. And we also tested this against a separate model run for the European domain. And we have the same relationships, same predictors. So, you know, we're confident from that testing from boreal to tropical, two different parts of the world, that that 
response function is is very robust. Sorry. Okay, so before I hand back to Stefano to run through a case study, I'll sort of just briefly explain a little bit of background about how it works. So you have different equations. <clears throat> and the equations are designed to run with data at a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. So for the amount of pollution removed, it doesn't really matter that you can scale that by area quite easily. But for changes in concentration, obviously you're changing concentrations within a defined volume of air. So you have to run the calculations at a 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. So the, the toolkit provides different ways of doing this. So you have different habitats within the 10 by 10 square. There's an approach you follow to do that. But there's guidance on how to approach this if you've got long linear habitats or if you've got much larger patches which span multiple grid cells. So I think I will stop there on the background and hand back to Stefano for a case study. Thank you, Lawrence. So today I'm only able to present the example of a site that is smaller than the grid cell, which is the scenario A among the three just introduced by, by, by Lawrence. So this case study is from a site that is part of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Initiative, which is an Asian Development Bank funded bird life uh, coordinated project to increase investment in important wetland sites for both migratory birds and people across several countries in Southeast Asia. So part of this work involved using TESA in initial scoping participatory workshops where stakeholders help determine key ecosystem services, but also a vision for the site and therefore what the alternative state in terms of land use change should be for this area. So one of the 12 sites analyzed in the Philippines, Balanga Wetlands Park, is found in North Manila Bay, which is one of the most densely populated areas in the country. And this site is a 0.4 square kilometer nature reserve and essentially a coastal wetland made up of mangroves and mud flats, which is what is meant by um, permanent waters in the table detailing the breakdown of land cover areas. And you may also notice how the expansion of the current mangrove area, which is the change we are going to assess in the pollution removal calculator, would likely need to happen outside the site boundaries, specifically at the expense of some of the aquaculture fish ponds found just southwest of this protected area, rather than the mud flats that remain critically important habitat for migratory birds. Now, for the purpose of explaining uh, how this case applies to the decision of what scenario to use in the pollution removal calculator, you can see here how the site is contained well within the single grid cell size of 10 by 10 kilometers. And again, you can also notice how close we are to a significantly urbanized environment from looking at the build up areas shown in red here. And um, this is the link to the website hosted by the Center for International Health Science Information Network at Columbia University, which we provide alongside the pollution removal calculator tool, and where if you don't have access to local data on fine particular matter concentrations, you can download these global data sets in the form of raster images, and the most recent one at the time of the release of the new module was uh, 2019. And um, this would be the third and last piece of information to enter in the pollution removal calculator tool, which is an Excel spreadsheet. So the average raster value of the background PM 2.5 concentration for the site as analyzed in GIS software, as we can see is 8.4 micrograms uh, per cubic meter. So the first piece of information to enter in the spreadsheet is the current habitat type that is projected to change in the future and the habitat to select for fish ponds under changing from is planted, cultivated, non-woody crops, others. And this is because it is the habitat type with the lowest coefficient for the pollution removal equation, which makes it the closest to permanent water bodies. And the habitat to select for mangroves under changing to is evergreen, broadly forests, tropical. And this is because the average mangrove height for the species found in the Philippines is, is two meters, which is 
greater than the threshold for shrubs. And so these mangroves should be considered evergreen broadleaf trees uh, of tropical climates. The second um, piece of information to enter in the spreadsheet is the area of the habitat that is changing. And so the TESA workshop run with stakeholders from the site um, established that a positive alternative state for Balanga in 2035 should entail an expansion of mangroves area by 116%. Uh, so that's an 116% increase of the existing 0.177 square kilometers equals 1.205 square kilometers of additional mangrove area. So with these three pieces of input here in um, yellow or, or light brown, the outcomes that are automatically calculated by Excel tool are threefold, the ones in red or darker brown. That, so the, uh, the quantity of PM uh, 2.5 removed resulting from habitat change, which is 234 kilograms. The quantity of additional nitrogen deposition also resulting from habitat change, which is eight kilograms of total nitrogen. And final, uh, the change in PM 2.5 um, concentration, which is minus uh, 0.003 microgram per cubic meter. And um, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have questions now or later, please contact me at this uh, email address. And here you also see the uh, link for downloading the TESA and the new chapter. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's a very um, important, you know, the toolkit that could allow quite a lot of, I mean, clear out some of the, um, you know, the field, some of the gaps uh, in this particular area. So yeah, is this is this toolkit, uh, um, you know, freely accessible, or is this, uh, um, how how if somebody wants to use it, what's the best way of kind of using it? Sorry, this could be my question actually. So I'm going to pass on to Sheila actually to take care of the Q&A session. That's okay. Well, Prashant, do you want you've asked your question, so would you like to answer that, Stefan or, or Lawrence? <laughs> yeah, happy to. Um, the yes, the toolkit is freely available. It can be downloaded at um, this website um, that I just um, copy and paste in the chat. And yeah, I welcome everybody attending today to check it out, including the new chapter, which is now for the time being uh, sort of standalone, but it's included in the download page that you, you find um, freely available at this link. Thank you. Okay, I mean, the, the, the main the main aspect in the Q&A at the moment is that, um, Alessio, if you could please send that paper through, that's one of the things that they really, was really been, been asked for. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any questions at the moment for either of our fantastic speakers today, or any of our fantastic speakers today, I should say. Um, if not, I've got a couple. Um, Alicia, you sort of um, mentioned right at the beginning that um, you looked at all the publications for rewilding, and actually it was only recently you saw that increase. Do you think people were actually doing some rewilding, but under different terms previously? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, yeah, so this is the, the thing that they use different terms. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, it's a buzzword. So now, you know, the people that are using rewilding um, to, to, to reflect, you know, this uh, approach of different maintenance management and uh, uh, so it's different from the first definition in the 90s uh, but but yeah uh, you know so, it's, 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 it's like nature-based solution now we are all referring to nature-based solution yeah yeah and and before was I don't know 30 years ago was just vegetation and you know there is a trend about you know uh some words that are even in academia and policy makers but the problem is that we don't have a definition for urban rewild this is the main issue and so when especially for policy makers uh, in the uk there is a nature recovery so is rewilding nature recovery so all this is very important because 
I'm a landscape architect. And during this process, also I want to understand in terms of visual, what was rewilding. And, and so during the workshop, we ask participants to show for them what re rewilding uh, means. And yeah, we had that scenarios. And even from the survey and the focus group, yeah, there are, you know, different perception of what rewilding is. And so yeah, the our recommendation is that we need to define to have a proper definition about urban rewilding. Otherwise, for some people, is to have uh, tigers and all these predators in cities. For others, it's just a nice wildflower meadow. Uh, so yeah, we need a definition. Okay, thank you. Um, and Prashant has put a question in, I think it's probably for Stefano, is it? Um, do you use different deposition velocities for individual ve vegetation type? And if so, what data source has been used to verify the deposition rates? Stefano is still there? Um, and Lawrence has just gone as well. So. Um, we may not we may not have have Stefano anymore. Um, so I'm afraid maybe both of our um, both of those speakers have left, I think. Um, but I do have another one for Alicia while we're sort of seeing whether anyone's around at the moment. Um, if we can I be quite short because we need to wrap up. Now, all right. If that's OK. Um, so one of the things I was just going to briefly ask um, you also looked at safe space and light and night. Why yeah. were people worried about, why did people have fear, do you think, about not having light in that space? Uh, or I intensive think, rewilding? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, the problem is it's about perception. So people don't, don't want to enter in a space that, that is, even if you think about my understanding is vegetation cover. So when it's intensive rewilding, and uh, you know, at, at the night you will see just dark. And uh, would you go in a dark area? And you know, there is also this perception of crime. Uh, and so people are concerned about the lighting. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is the this is the problem. This is our perception as a human being, uh, yeah. and there are some people that try to avoid green spaces at night. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, Lucia. Um, yeah. And I think I now pass back to Prashant to finish. Yes, thank you very much, Sila. Um, so I think I'm gonna just uh, uh, take a another minute or so to introduce uh, the next upcoming webinar that's going to be on 5th of June for the same time. And we've got two fantastic speakers, the Professor Darren Wolf. So he is the head of building physics and he's leading one of those UK uh, urban environment equality partnerships group and he will provide an update on that. So there's quite a lot of interesting work in that group on the green infrastructure. And we got Howard Gray uh, talking about the business relations um, he's a business relationship specialist and talk about the green blue, uh, uh, you know, the ways to guarantee kind of green. So it's going to be very interesting, you know, presentations. So I'll encourage you to uh, to join them. And just to finish uh, that, if you're not a member of the network, so you can go to our website and you can have the, um, you know, you, you can you can you can still register yourself. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Reclaim Network uh, X account to get more updates. Uh, before you go, just to bring to your attention, if you have not already registered for the upcoming conference, which is going to be in London and the registrations are free, I would encourage you to register and also share with your colleagues or in your network. And uh, um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank both or three of our speakers today and to uh, Professor Sila Marlon for chairing this session and to all of our team members, especially um, Salad, Mark and uh, Sise for helping with this organization. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. See you next month.
Thank you. Bye.